Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. Patrick Sullivan recently did an expose video on glue joints. I'm going to share with you how I think that might impact the way we build furniture. Stay with me. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help you take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, be sure to subscribe, turn on that notification bell, and don't forget to turn on the notification on your mobile device so you'll know every time we release a new video. Good? All right, back to the bench. So the video that is linked below, Patrick did what I think is a fantastic job. Talk about being scientific and really leaving no question as to whether or not he did it properly. I think all of that was spot on. And I've been getting tons of questions and emails. How is this going to impact your woodworking now that this myth has been debunked? Well, the myth being debunked is that two pieces of wood glued end grain to end grain did not have sufficient strength. Is that going to actually change the way we actually build something? I don't think so. And I say that only because if you're putting two pieces of wood together to build a case, you need to have a strong corner joint. And I'm going to prove, or at least I'm going to attempt to prove in this video, that that joint with just end grain to end grain glue strength alone is not sufficiently strong enough. However, it has made some significant changes that I'm going to address as we go through the video. But in his video, he really proved the point that this is very strong. In fact, we played around a little bit ourselves. We took two pieces of aspen and we glued them together. I left it there overnight. And then I had one of the fellows at work here. We put it in a vise and so that I wouldn't influence the decision. He grabbed a hold of it, it was about out to here, and pushed and pushed, and it took a lot of force to break that. Well, I don't think construction guys are going to start lengthening their 2x4s by, by gluing them end to end, but it certainly gives you something to think about. I did another one where I, I took a piece of poplar and I glued it like so, as you would on a shelf in a case, and it was extremely strong. Now, it didn't have the kind of shear strength we were looking for, but it was remarkably strong. And that is going to play out how I'm going to make a change. Anyway, I think the video was extremely well done. I'm not going to knock it at all. In fact, it opened up my eyes and it's going to make me make some serious changes to the way I currently woodwork. Several other videos have been done on this already. Mark at the Wood Whisper and my friend Stumpy Nubs have addressed it both in very good videos and very detailed. And uh, I think they did a fantastic job. So what am I going to do different? Well. I want to just address how am I going to take what Patrick has exposed, enlightened, and how am I going to change what I currently do? Okay, yeah. so we built a piece of furniture, and we're going to employ several joints. Um, there's probably no more than four or five. There may be variations of those, but as far as basic joints, there's not many more than that. Um, you think of mortise and tenon or some very variation. You think of a dovetail or some variation, including a box joint or a finger joint. You think of a dado, and you think of a rabbit and some variation of any, or any combination of those. That's pretty much gonna cover the basis. So if you're using, we're gonna, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through and talk about these one at a time with some examples and see, is there somewhere where this revelation about end grain strength when it comes to gluing would make a substantial enhancement to that joint. So if you're going to do a, a piece of framework, now that might be the, uh, the frame that creates your frame and panel door, it could be the frame around the cabinet, whatever, we know that we just can't simply come in and glue that piece onto that piece. Why? Well, even if the glue joint is superior, it's going to pull the long grain apart. As, as was evidenced when we glued the end grain of this piece onto this face grain of the opposite piece, it pulled the, uh, it pulled the wood apart and didn't exhibit enough strength for the application. So we have what's called a mortise and tenon. And if you're not familiar with it, that's called the mortise. It's a rectangular shaped hole cut into the wood or at the end of the wood, depending on where it is. And the tenon is a square peg, which is part of the second piece that is designed to fit in there. And in case you're wondering, on a piece of three-quarter inch material, you split it up into thirds. So you have one third, one third, and one third. If we look at this one. And I did two just to, so we cover all the bases. So here you're creating a T of some form where you're joining a piece perpendicular to another piece and you're going to create 
a tenon on there that would go into that hole. You want the fit to be just right so that you get good long grain to long grain glue surface. That's a phrase I've used over the years. Where could we improve this by adding the strength that is associated with end grain gluing? Well, the most obvious is probably out here on the shoulders. The problem is here, 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 and here. On this application, that actually could be used. Uh, it's going to provide, it's going to uh, create squeeze out, but over here that doesn't really matter because that's going to be cleaned off anyway. It becomes a bit of an irritant when you have to dig it out of the corner. And the reason I say that is once you've got glue, if you try to do it when the glue is still wet, it tends up to smear all over the place. If you wait till it's dry, then you're having to cut it out with a chisel, which always you risk the dam uh, you risk damaging the wood. The other on the other place would be along the ends of the mortise, their end grain. However, you do have cross grain construction in here, meaning this piece is going to move ever so slightly. But on a small piece like that, I suppose you could add glue to there. It certainly wouldn't hurt. Uh, typically, you don't get that joint, that surface very clean, whether it's a hollow chisel mortiser or a chisel. And of course, you always have to balance, is it worth the extra work? And that's where the, uh, the real factoring comes in. But before we address that, let's consider one more. You also have the end grain of the tenon touching the long grain of the bottom of the mortise. Well, trust me, to go in there and get that smooth enough to actually make a difference you, it would not be worth it. The other problem you have is you have to have somewhere for that excess glue to go. Once you've glued up the sides of, these, of this mortise and then you force that tenon down. Now, I always come in and I cut a chamfer on the end of the tenon for the very purpose of allowing some of the glue to squeeze by so that you don't end up forcing it all to the bottom of the joint. And that little chamfer will allow some of it to run up the side, or actually you don't put it on this piece, but it allows some of it to run by as you're forcing it down, and you end up with a little bit of glue, which is all you really need if it's a good fit, between the long grain of the mortise and the long grain of the tenon. If you were to make it so that that actually bottomed out against that piece, there is no place for that extra glue to go. The hydraulic force of putting clamps on there could easily blow something out, and I don't think it's worth it. Where, where would I possibly change this? Well, I would, on a narrow mortise, a narrow member like that, I wouldn't uh, hesitate to put a little bit of glue on here. It's not the greatest glue surface. I wouldn't bother to go in and clean that up, but there would be some value even in a rough cut piece that I would put a little bit on there. I might even put a little bit on here on the shoulders since it's easy to clean up. If I was doing it this way and you were joining a piece, I would say, no way, it's not worth it. By the time you close that joint, you now got squeeze out all the way around. It adds to the workload. And remember, in order to do this efficiently, this piece needs to be finished before you put this piece in. If not, you're trying to sand into a corner and that's way too much work. So to protect that finished surface, I wouldn't bother to put any on that outside. Now, what about down here on the end? Typical of a frame on a door. You have a little bit of a piece here that fits into an extended groove that your panel would sit into. So you'd close that so you get a nice strong joint. And having that little piece on there just gives it a little more resistance to twisting. It's probably going to be, just as it is, sufficiently strong. In fact, I would bet that before the glue fails, just with what we've been doing, gluing the long grain to long grain, that the wood is going to fail first. Same idea, however, the only extra end grain gluing would be along the shoulder, along the end, and possibly up here in the end. Would I bother doing it? Well, again, maybe a little bit up in here. I wouldn't bother with trying to clean up that bottom, and I certainly wouldn't bother, bother putting any in here. If you wanted to, you could go in and you could add some to this surface and to this surface. As I mentioned, you're going to clean, flush that off anyway, so it wouldn't be that big of a deal to clean up but I certainly don't want to be in there digging out glue. So I would say maybe a 10% change in the way we might cut a mortise and tenon when it comes to a frame. Okay, this joint, I have high hopes. It, this uh, strength of a 
end grain glue joint is going to make a big difference. So this is a dado, also called a trench or a housing. So what we've done is I've cut a groove or a dado across the width of the board. It's a quarter of an inch deep. Now if you want to do it precisely, it's always best to shoulder the opposite piece. Instead of trying to fit a piece like this in, which may or may not be the exact same thickness, you have made a bit of a gap. It's easier to actually cut a very, a very small shoulder all the way around. That way you can make it so that this fits in there perfectly. Now, so what I'm relying on, there is no long grain to long grain glue surface in this joint at all. We've got long grain here against end grain here. We've got end grain here against long grain here. That's essentially the bulk of it. So it's important, if the end grain is going to hold or add to it, it's important that this surface touch there at the same time this shoulder comes up tight against this surface. So what I did is after I cut that out on the dado, I finished it here with the chisel. Then I used my router plane to come in and get that the same depth all the way around. I went over to the table saw. Be just before I did, I took my marking gauge and I set my marking gauge so that it measured the exact depth of that dado. And then I took that and I created my shoulder all the way around. I did most of this on the table saw. I prefer to stand it up like this with a rip blade and with your fence set, make one pass, flip it around and make the other pass and you can keep moving the fence, taking a little bit each time until you finally get it exactly where you want it. And then to make sure that that line was nice and clean, I cut just almost to it with the table saw and I came back and I finished it with my marking gauge so that it was nice and clean all the way around. So now what we need to do is check to make sure it fits. And when I say fit, you want a snug enough fit. You don't want to rely just on the mechanical fit because if you're that tight, you're probably not going to have any glue there at all. If it's loose, the glue doesn't fill in the gaps at all. So that won't provide you anything. What we want is just, just the right fit that will allow a little bit of glue to help close that joint. And I'll put one on the other side. Now the reason I'm, I'm excited at the possibility that this could actually be all you need when doing this type of a joint is that it because it cuts out a whole lot of extra work. I in the past would have come in and done a, a double mortise and tenon, perhaps two there, two there, and two there, which is a tremendous amount of work. Or I'd come in and I would dowel it, multiple dowels along there, all the while having the dado with this piece in there because of its effect on resisting shear forces. But you always had to, at least I thought, you always had to go in and do something to reinforce that joint. The simplest was to simply come from the bottom side and toenail up like that, multiple, toenail, multiple nails along there. It's hidden, it's up underneath, but it would help to hold the joint together. If this works, it's gonna be great. Now, if you think about a dado, and the reason why, the reason why we couldn't just glue a piece on like this, there's just not enough shear force or resistance to shear force. Typically, this is going to be the horizontal member on a bookcase or chest of drawer or something, and there's going to be a fair amount of force acting like that. You also want to have a fair bit of tensile force to prevent that from pulling out. Why would it pull out? Well, as this solid wood side wants to cup or bow, there's a possibility that that joint will get pulled apart. Would be another reason for having some form of mechanical fastening, whether it be a through wedge tenon or a screw or a nail up there. I'm hoping this is going to do it. We don't have to worry about uneven expansion because this piece is going to expand the same rate as that. So that shouldn't be a problem at all. Now, to help get that glue, or to help disperse that glue, I'm going to take my shoulder plane. I'm going to come in here. I'm just going to cut a little chamfer on the leading edge right here. And we're going to put this together. I'm going to clamp it. And we're going to wait a day, give it plenty of time to dry before we stress test it to see if, in fact, it will do the job. Okay. So remember, no glue on this side. If we want to, we could glue the bottom here. But anything we put on here is going to get pushed up and then we're going to have to be digging it out from underneath. So what I'm going to do is with my little 
small bottle. I'm going to come in and try to lay a little bead right on the top of this shoulder and gravity will pull it down. And I think we can spread glue on the bottom of this. Not a lot because there's no room for anything extra to go. But that way we know we got good coverage. And I'm going to use the end of my bench as a means of, as a call. And that uh, just reduce the number of clamps I need. Okay, let that sit for the best part of a day, and then we'll test it. Okay, how does it apply to a through dovetail? I've cut a few dovetails. So typically, when we cut a through dovetail, we glue just the long grain. And I'm putting an X on all the long grain surfaces, each side of the pins, and each side of the tails. And I'm going to tell you that that is enough. What could we gain by end grain? Well, I've always put a little bit out here, but I usually did it just because Alan Peters used to do it, and I think if anything, it might have closed a little bit of a gap you'd have there. And that's a critical aspect, because if you open a drawer, it's the first thing you see is that joint right there. Does it add any strength to it? Eh, I wouldn't think so. You've got end grain here on the bottom of these sockets. Now the question is, in order for that to be effective, you would have to make that perfectly flat. So when you check it with your little square, it has to touch all the way across. Well, that takes a whole lot of extra work. We can crank those out in a matter of minutes, if not seconds. So do, do we need the extra strength? Well, so I'm going to show you. There's a three-tail joint that I did several days ago, so meaning it's plenty dry. And the uh, pieces on here are, look to be about 11 inches. They are 11 inches long. This is a slippery floor. I would say that if this will take my weight, there's no reason to make that joint any stronger. Okay? So stronger than the application is going to require. So bottom line, not worth the extra work to make sure those are perfectly flat. In case you don't know, we slightly undercut them just so you get a better fit when the joint closes. You're guaranteed a nice tight fit on the both sides of the joint. So nothing changes on a through dovetail. So a half blind is what you typically find on the front of a drawer. And this is where I'm going to see a change. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping this, in fact, I know this is going to make a big difference based on a little bit of experience I already had in testing the strength of end grain gluing. This is called your end lap. And uh, I always like to make them as thin as I can get away with. The problem has always been, since they weren't glued, you could tap on that and it just found, it sounded weak. And if it were to catch something, if it was thin enough, it would actually possibly break. So what we're gonna do is go in and we're gonna glue that end, try it and see what it turns out like. Now I purposely have cut a dovetail, a half blind in pine, and left that just a sixteenth of an inch. That would be a major no-no. That would almost guarantee to break, but we're going to see if we can get away with it. So first thing I'm going to do is take my marking gauge and reset my marking gauge to the original setting and then use my marking gauge to come in here. In fact, because that's so thin, I'm actually going to put a piece behind it just to support it so that it doesn't push away. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to check and you can see the little bit of material coming up. Well, this guarantees that that back wall is parallel to the front. So when we put this together, it's not going to accidentally cause the joint to spread. Now you can never get right into the corners, but you can get close and you can get close enough to then follow up with your chisel and just finish that off in the corner. Don't leave any debris in there. It'll kick your joint apart. Hey, if you like this video, we have more. Our monthly newsletter has subscriber-only content, discounts monthly on tools, and anything we bring out that's new, subscribers get first crack at it. Click on the link below. Let's get back to work. Okay, last step. This is the inside of the joint. We've chamfered these inside corners to help disperse the glue along the sides of the pins. 
But now we're also going to come in and we're just going to cut a chamfer on the bottom edge of these tails and that will help spread that glue along that end wall. Oops, I should be going this way. But other than that, everything will be done the same. For right now, and I'm not going to bother with the bottom of the sockets. I'm not trying to get make this joint stronger. What I am trying to do is to strengthen that end lap so it doesn't appear so weak and we can get away with really thin or a really thin end lap should we want to. But now I'm going to come in here and just butter that back wall. Not too much. You've got to have some place for the excess to go. We'll let that sit. We're going to give that at least an hour and then we'll flush it up and do the tap test and see how that turns out. As a final test on how the strength of an end grain glue joint could possibly change the way we work, I'm going to simulate a carcass construction or a carcass corner. So off camera I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to dovetail these two pieces. And they're eight inches wide by seven eighths of an inch thick. This is going to represent my carcass. And that will be a traditional dovetail corner. We'll give it 24 hours to dry, and then we'll test it. Right now, what we're going to do is we're going to just apply, do this, create the same corner, but just with a rabbit. So this piece serves to hide the end of this board. And our glue surface is going to be long grain onto end grain, pardon me, end grain onto long grain and end grain onto long grain. So there's quite a bit of surface area. Curious to see how it works. Now to take it up a step, what I'm going to do is come in here and I'm going to shoot the end of this board so that instead of gluing against the somewhat rough surface coming from a table saw, we're going to have a nice clean hand plane surface. Okay, so we'll apply uh, maybe two clamps here and then we need something to pull down on it. That's, I left that just a little bit proud. We can flush it off of the plane afterwards, but it'll allow the clamp to sit on there. So we don't want to be messy with the glue, but we'll apply glue on the end grain of this section. Again, the idea is not to get a whole bunch of squeeze out on that inside corner. Get good even coverage. Gonna drag some of that out of the corner just so that it doesn't create a problem, prevent that from closing. That looks to be square. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and dovetail. That one, we'll let them both sit a day, and then we'll check them and see, will this be strong enough for carcass construction? Okay, we've given this stuff at least a day to dry, so now the results. This, is, uh, this, one's, this one is definitely a game changer. So here's a half-blind dovetail. 
No glue between the end lap, this piece, and the end of the tail. This is walnut, and that's better than an eighth of an inch thick. There's a piece of pine. That end lap is, wouldn't even be a sixteenth of an inch, but it was glued. So listen to the difference. So that's not going to come off. So I will definitely add that to the way I cut half blinds. I'm not going to, I'm not typically going to leave, it, leave an end lap that thin, but I like the fact that you can without having to worry about it. Okay, next one is, and it also deals with the dovetail. So if you're building a case, I would suggest that you use dovetails to make that case nice and strong. It'll last forever. This was dadoed, or uh, pardon me, a rabbit that was glued. So you've had effective glue surface, pardon me, I shouldn't say effective. That's a judgment call too early to make. You have glue surface between the end grain of this piece and the long grain of that end lap. You have glue surface between the face grain of this piece and the end grain of that section. And on a dovetail piece of the same dimension, same dimension, same thickness, you have glue between all of the long grain to long grain pieces. So here, 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 and on each side of each pin. And of course, I always put a little bit of glue right here. I don't really think it contributes that much, but we'll see. I was trying to decide how best to test these. And I think the easiest way is just to put them on the ground and stand on them and see what it takes to break them. Um, I'll do the dovetail one first. So with my pockets full, easy 200 pounds. I can jump on that, and I don't think I would be able to break it. I have no idea what's going to, what to expect here. Wow. Well, that was impressive. Let me try that again. Both feet. Both feet. Oh my goodness. I, I don't know what to say. That I did not expect. That's a huge wow. I would still favor the dovetails for the look of it, but I can't believe the strength that that had. Patrick. All right, so the last one is more typical of what I was hoping, or I shouldn't say more typical. This is what I was uh, expecting to be good. So this, we, we cut that dado, we went in a quarter of an inch, and uh, now I cut, I set it back just because typically if you were building this, you'd want to have that set back. But the dado actually runs from about right here. Now, how best to test that? Well. I'm, I'm, I'm so uh, I'm so stunned at this last demo that I don't know whether we can even break this. So I'm just going to try whacking. No, all right. So one whack on the shelf broke that free. I was think I was hoping that was going to actually withstand more than that. Let's. There's quite a bit of leverage considering how far away we were hitting. Interesting what broke. Snap that whole piece. Well, the glue joint didn't fail. The end grain pulled all of that long grain fiber. And on the sides, there really isn't much there, but the question is, would that have held in, uh, in its typical use? Certainly, you're not going to be beating on it like that. And the other side of it would have been glued into the op an opposing piece. The big question is, would it have resisted, would it have resisted tensile force, meaning pulling, being a pull apart like that? And I think based on that, it would have. I'll go with that. I will use that and consider it to be all I need in terms of strength. I, I can't get over this. I really can't. That, that just blows me away that that joint was that strong. I'm almost speechless. Wow.
If you enjoy my method of work and like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. I've always said better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the plane and chisel icon below, it'll take you to our site and introduce you to all the tools that we actually manufacture right here in our shop. It'll also give you information on our in-person and online workshops.